So our first request this afternoon is a growth. Our good news from my good heart. And we were delighted to welcome up a lot of uh, our guests today and deliver a keynote presentation. I do know that the guests are really, really interesting. And also just extend our thanks to those of you that have all the hosts That's on our right. website as much appreciated as you have read it about events and things like that. So I shall pass over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I've got quite a, a lot to live up to, given this morning's, which have been dynamic, uh, impressive, suave, all kinds of things that I'm not necessarily going to be. But I'd like to say thank you to PT PTFS. I arrived last night and I've been looked after. Um, stayed up too late, unfortunately. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it doesn't make it's it's, it's silly because I've got a two-year-old at home who doesn't sleep very well. So I had the one opportunity in my in my life to to get a good night's sleep, and I went back to my room at one one a.m. and <laughs> thought, oh well, there it goes. So a bit about me to start off with. Um, so I'm a software developer. Currently, my job title is full stack developer for Ordnance Survey. I don't really like the idea of a full stack developer. It's quite hard to explain what it really is. It sounds like a breakfast that you might order. But in reality, it's just that I do lots of things. That means I might do database development. I might do creating a mobile app or a website or some server-side programming or desktop app. Um, it kind of means a jack of all trades and a master of none. Um, I come from a public sector background to an extent, so I've worked for lots of councils, Bristol, Bath and North East Somerset, Reading Council, uh, Libraries West, who manage kind of library management systems for seven library services in the Southwest, so quite a lot of kind of council experience. Um, that was where I was a library systems officer, so where I got particularly into library systems. Um, at that time, they'd moved from Axial to Circe Dynix. Uh, I'm also a geospatial software developer which is a fancy way of saying I do maps. So obviously working for Ordnance Survey. Uh, everyone knows Ordnance Survey for the paper maps, but that's really a fraction of kind of Ordnance Survey business. It's more about kind of data technology and, and, and data, data services. Uh, I'm also really keen on dogs and coffee. and I try to kind of tweet about those two things as much as possible. So this presentation is peppered with pictures of dogs and occasionally coffee, I think, but yeah, not always. And that particular dog is my brother's uh, puppy, who is very charming, and I had a chance to meet at the weekend. <laughs> uh, I also once emailed Devon Library. So Devon have got a mobile library service, and I said, can you send me all your photos of dogs in mobile libraries? And they collected them all together and sent them back to me, which is amazing. So I've got lots of photos of, that's just a random dog. I don't know who that is. But that's a dog in a mobile library. So there'll be, there'll be a few of those, which are, are really good. <laughs> so a bit about my history and open. So I'm talking about open making things better. Primarily, that's from an open data point of view from my history. And it kind of started in 2012. So I was a, back when I was young, I was trying to kind of do development and trying to create a mobile app. And around the time, it was quite the, the early days of mobile apps. So people were doing a lot of kind of find my, <laughs> whatever, it might be find my post box or find my post office or, or whatever nearest, nearest bin, whatever it might be. And I thought, well, I'll do a find my library, which seemed like a you know, great thing that we might have. You know, people could download a, a library finder, wherever they are, find the nearest library. And I kind of discovered there was no data. So, you know, aside from going to each kind of council website, trying to collect the data, there was no significant data on, on, on where libraries were, which was a shame. <laughs> I ended up joining Bath and North East Somerset around a bit, a bit shortly after um, and started working on opening up data. So all, all kinds of different council type data, licenses, bins, which is a really exciting one, uh, planning applications, all those kind of things that you, people who are in sort of public sector will know about. And then the community group started up called Bath Hacked. So I've completely stolen Bath Hacked's name with Libraries Hacked. But the idea is that Bath, between Bath Hacked was a community group who would take open data, primarily being published at the time by me from the council, and just make really good applications and tools and things to help the community uh, with. Then I kind of launched Libraries Hacked, 
started promoting open data from libraries, again, primarily public libraries, but there's no reason why it can't be cross-sector. And since sort of 2014-ish, I've been advocating for library services to do more in terms of open um, up until the present. So just a few projects I've worked on over the last couple of years. Uh, libraries and high streets. So during the pandemic, I took some data we had on library locations actually from a survey the Arts Council had done, tried to map that to data that on high streets. So high streets actually have a, it's not a formal definition, but a kind of experimental definition that Ordnance Survey created um, a few years ago. And so you can kind of start to actually map whether libraries are on high streets or not. It's one of these kind of questions that Quite often people say, oh, libraries are the centre of the high street, or they're, you know, there isn't a high street if it doesn't have a library on it. Technically, libraries are actually very rarely on high streets, but they're normally quite close to high streets, at least. I think 60% of libraries are kind of on a high street or near to a high street, and primarily near to a high street. So that was a really interesting project. Um, I also discovered that libraries are actually geospatially spread out across all kinds of urban and rural areas. So they're not, they're not really high street locations in, in the fact that they actually appear in all kinds of different levels of rurality. So even a, a small hamlet, which you know, has no high street, often might have a, a library. Another product, I've obviously mentioned mobile libraries. So I did a mobile library tracker, which was to take mobile library data on locations of stops. So normally when you go to a council website and you might be interested in your mobile library, you'll download a PDF or maybe two PDFs. One will have the kind of list of stops and then you'll have to cross-reference that to the timetable, which is then another PDF. So a really tedious thing to have to do, particularly for people on mobile devices and whatever. So I tried to take, convert all those PDFs into real data, create a kind of data schema and there's a mobile library tracker out there called mobilelibraries.org, which shows all the mobile libraries actually moving around in kind of real time. Uh, and you can kind of click on it and see where it's going to be next. And a bit like a kind of dashboard of like where you get on a bus stop to see when it's, when it's next arriving. So that's quite cool. Um, if I say so myself. <laughs> and then a similar one for library map, actually. So, so discovering more data, we fi I finally managed to make the kind of find my library app which is available at Library Map. But that's just a kind of uh, a general introduction to the kind of projects I like working on. But to move more kind of generally, I quite often, well, people, people ask me kind of what, what open means, and it's not, it's not a vague term. Quite often it gets used in a kind of vague way. You'll kind of see materials from suppliers or various people who kind of just use open all the time. Now, obviously, PTFS kind of use open all the time, but in a very genuine way, because they're talking about open source, and that's a very specific thing. Uh, but open in general is really, so it's content, information, or data that people are free to use, reuse, or and redistribute without any uh, restrictions. So it's really quite strict on the fact that you have to be able to access the data. You know, it has to be free to use. Um, you're not, you've got a price barrier on it or any kind of other barrier to actually to getting that data and using it. Now there's different kinds of open. So there's open standards. An open standard might just be how a light bulb is built and people can follow that standard, you know, build a light bulb that works in your house. Open source, obviously like Koha and others, is software where the code should be published, it should be openly available, people can go and expect it, inspect it. It doesn't necessarily mean people can contribute to it. Sometimes that's more, more locked, up, locked down. But it means that it's, it's kind of open, openly available. Uh, similarly, open access. I know a lot of the kind of academic sector will know about open access and how uh, research publications can be made available on open access platforms, which will give you the opportunity to, or anyone the opportunity to look up research, download it, reuse it, you know, build upon it. Similarly, open government. Uh, a bit more of a probably general term, but kind of the idea that governments and institutions should be transparent and open, and everything they do made open in some way. So it might be data, it might be information, uh, it might be various things, but they're, they're kind of making sure they are being open in, in their business. 
uh, another, another dog in a mobile library. <laughs> now this one I particularly like, so one, this is actually not just a random dog in a mobile library. I kind of think of this as a librarian who's <laughs> standing in the doorway of a mobile library, looking out and kind of looking, I'd probably say quite suspicious and worried. That's probably the two main, main terms I'd say, suspicious and worried. Taking that as a metaphor for libraries approaching open data or open, open information, I think it's relatively representative of the kind of caution in, in the sector. So one thing I'd like to say is open is for everyone. So quite often we talk in technical terms, open source, open data, all kinds of things that are re relatively digital service based, you know, quite difficult sometimes to delve into for people who are maybe developers or uh, who write standards or schemas, all those kind of things. But in reality, working in the open isn't reserved to digital. Uh, there's day-to-day -day examples of open knowledge everywhere. And we should celebrate um, all the kinds of things we see that are built on some aspect of open working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through five kind of case studies of open that hopefully are a bit more kind of easy to understand than being an open source software or, or, or something like that. And I've continued the pattern of all presentations must include a map, which is really good. Oh, we have some amazing maps as well today. Thank you very much for all, all the maps. <laughs> now, one example, so climate change is obviously big on everyone's, everyone's agenda. Uh, when I was in Bath and Northeast Somerset Council, one data set I released was energy usage of all public buildings. Um, and really detailed, so 30-minute readings you know, of, of gas and electricity. That went out to the community. There was a huge impact in terms of people starting to look at the data. One person looked at the Bath Central Library data and kind of worked out that they could be saving, I think, about 20 grand a year in terms of the kind of lights they were using and those kind of things. But one project I really liked was that it included the school data. So a, a project called Energy Sparks got funding from the Open Data Institute. And we were able to create a website and tool that would allow school kids to kind of engage with their energy usage. They were able to kind of take part in competitions, kind of gamify the data to some extent. And that became really popular. The map actually represents Energy Spark schools at the moment. So it's kind of spanned out from beyond Bath Council to actually across, across the UK. And yeah, they're, they're working now on an energy education program for schools that is, is you know, UK based and hopefully should be really exciting in terms of challenging, you know, challenging current uh, current uses of uh, energy. Another example, so I came up on the train yesterday and I came from Bradford Navon where I live in the southwest and I got a ticket to Leeds. Now a ticket to Leeds is extraordinarily expensive but if you get a ticket from Bradford Navon to Cheltenham and then a ticket from Cheltenham to Birmingham and then a ticket from Birmingham to Derby and then a ticket from Derby to Sheffield, and then a ticket from Sheffield to Leeds. It's about half the price. <laughs> now, it's not, they're not advanced tickets. They're not restricted in any way. That is just the, the nature of our train system, which I've tried to represent through some Brillo, which I, I created a couple of weeks ago. And I was really proud of that one, because it, it, it has bridges, it has all kinds of things, it tunnels, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> But in 2013, so we have a complex train system, we have a complex fares, we have complex everything regarding trains. In 2013, rail data was released in terms of the fares that were in different you know, proportions of the rail, rail network. If you do want to buy a ticket and search Google for, uh, or Bing or DuckDuckGo, one of those good, good alternatives, uh, search split ticketing and you can buy cheaper tickets. It will be a bit more faff because you do have to buy you know, hundreds, hundreds of tickets, but you will make the saving. And that's all purely from open data on, on rail fares being released to the kind of the common market. Now, I like this particular example because it's a, a, a government example where they managed to save a huge amount of money through no work, effectively no work of the, that they did themselves. So in 2010, the UK government were obliged to 
release spending data. So all departments kind of got on with a regular process of just releasing data on what they'd kind of spent. From that, uh, that data is quite difficult to kind of interpret. It's released by department. Everyone kind of has to go and look up that data. So there was a, a tool built from outside of government called Open Spending, which actually aggregated the data together, made it kind of searchable, and allowed people to, to use it in a more effective way. At some point then, I think quite a few years later, someone in government asked the question as to whether they could make efficiency savings by ensuring they weren't duplicating pro, uh, purchases. So quite often government departments will buy, in this case, I think it was premium reports that cost hundreds of pounds. And another government department would have bought the same report for no, no particular reason, well, for a reason to use it, but they didn't know the other department had, had also bought the same report. Our government didn't know how to actually find this out. They had no idea of how to actually, they didn't have a single search system to kind of work out where they were duplicating payments. So they just discovered for themselves they could use the open spending platform to discover where they were actually doing duplicate purchases. And that ended up saving them four million pounds of just wasted money. So it's a good example of where open working kind of had an external benefit was used and then the benefit came back into the, the originating organization. Now a lot of you will probably know um, blue plaques. So when you walk around cities you see blue plaques which might say Virginia Woolf was born here or someone so and so, and so was born and lived in a particular place. There was also a website called Open Plaques. So that, that, that blue plaque data is fairly hard to come by in terms of there's no central data set. So a load of people uh, created open plaques, which is a kind of crowdsourced tool for seeing where blue plaques are, and you can kind of look up where different ones are, search them and all kinds of things. Now a couple called Terence and Elizabeth Eden applied that then to memorial benches, which is another thing that you see when you're walking about in parks, all kinds of places. What you can do is you can have that, that tool on your phone, as soon as you see a memorial bench, take a photo of it, it records the inscription, and then you can upload that and share it for, for everyone. Now there's now 26, I think 26,000 across the world, so it's really kind of taken off and captured people's imagination in terms of you know, publishing that data openly. So it's kind of open in terms of the, the person recording the photo is sharing it. Obviously then the website is sharing it to, to everyone. And I kind of prefer memorial benches to plaques because a memorial bench can quite often say, Harry used to sit in this park and he hated everyone in it, that, that kind of thing. You know, it's, they're, they're more intriguing than blue plaques, which are often fairly kind of dry and respectful. Whereas if you note, if you walk around and actually look at memorial benches, you'll find they're not very respectful at all. They're, they're kind of just jokes or in-jokes or whatever they might be, but they're more intriguing. And I love the fact there's a, website kind of recording them all. And then the fi final one, this was a project I worked on when I was in Bath again. Um, so as part of a community project, there's a website called Wheelmap. So for wheelchair users and actually anyone who has kind of dif difficulty over various um, surfaces and needs accessible entrances to places, the idea is that you'd map all public, uh, public locations, so probably cafes and restaurants and, and anywhere that has a kind of entrance, and record details for, for people who need accessible entrances. That's really interesting. It kind of gives details of um, things like accessible toilets in, in the location, whether there are multiple flights, whether there's a lift, all those kind of things. Completely open data, completely crowdsourced, really essential tool that's kind of needed for the people who who you know who have accessibility needs and need to know if they're going to go to a place whether or not it does have a a toilet that they can they can go into or whether or not they have to ring a bell to get help to get into it um, so we had a a volunteer day where we went over to over 300 destinations which is really good managed to kind of crowdsource information and doubled the coverage within bath at that time of of the kind of accessibility of, of places.
Now, this has all been very preachy. I appreciate you're going to be saying open is great, and you're going to say, yeah, that's, that's fine. I also appreciate that libraries know all about open already. So libraries, to some extent, are an original open knowledge advocate. So when I go into a library, whether it's a public library, or I'm sure academic library, I'm there with the expectation that I'm going to gain knowledge and the library is going to share it with me. It's a pretty fundamental principle. So one thing I'm mean, like to be positive about libraries, one thing I kind of found frustrating in the kind of fight for open data or open source or whatever it might be is the idea that this is a fundamental principle already of libraries, but there's a slight caution, I think, in terms of embracing open data and publishing our data. Um, when in, in reality, the open set of principles actually fit with the ethos of libraries, you know, fairly obviously, you know, in my mind, and we should be kind of embracing open, making sure that everything we do is open to an extent. Second map. So we have loads of information in libraries, loads of data. Uh, obviously, we've talked already today about protecting data, making sure we're privacy conscious. That doesn't mean we can't start to actually think about what data we hold and start to release it. So there's all kinds of data. We've got you know catalogs and collections, loans, membership, visitors, footfall, events, mobile library timetables, and library locations. Now, whatever sector you're in, I think you pretty much have all of those, you know, as libraries. It might be making them open to your students, your users, it might not necessarily be to the public, but all these things can be made open. The example on the right was a project I run with quite a few library services where we explored their membership data. So the, if I just come over here, the green dots are the location of libraries. And the shading of the map represents the peak in membership. So you actually notice, start to notice things like where you have libraries, you have high membership of libraries. It sounds obvious, but it's not necessarily been proven or kind of looked at many times. In the areas where you, have, you don't have libraries, you have really, really low membership. So I've, I've noticed in certain areas you have kind of 0% membership. In other areas you might have 50, 60% membership. That's the kind of data that can be openly published, you know, anonymized and everything, and actually people can start to create tools to really look at that, that data. And it's essential to libraries to look at where the membership are, you know, where the membership aren't to some extent. Um, so I think it'd be really useful to start publishing membership data. And just, <laughs> I can't remember, I think that's Cuthbert, there's different, different kind of cakes with different names, they all copy each other. <laughs> so, I mean, on a wider point, benefits of, of open digital services for libraries can be all the kinds of things I've explored. Um, tapping into a wider knowledge base, you know, getting other people to do things for you, not in a kind of forcing them way, just the fact that when you start publishing data and knowledge, people start using it and it, it reflects well back on you. Again, that can lead into even co-creation of library services, so people creating tools which the library service then promote themselves or use themselves. Um, it helps to promote the service. So if you're publishing more and more data and, and information and knowledge, that's getting your message out there always. Um, it can inspire creative ideas and it can also allow for competing digital services. So one example I like to think of is that your library online presence doesn't have to be your own website. It can be someone else's website, or it can be an organization that want to put your catalog search onto their pages for, for whatever reason. You can let people then sort of choose where they would use, you know, they might, they might go to another website to search your catalog. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's fine. Mobile apps, you know, when I, when I want to use a, a Twitter client, which I won't be doing very, very soon, I think, but it, you have, you have options. You can download the official one, you can download an alternative, and that's because Twitter are fairly open about their APIs and, and their data. But that's, again, I've kind of reverted back to type in terms of talking about technology, data, open source. But that's not really just only what Working in the Open is doing. So you can blog about things, you can just 
talk about what you're doing, to reflect upon what you've, what you've done, share it with the community, share it with the public. That's all working, working in the open. Uh, strategy, roadmaps, plans. Quite often I see people kind of being quite secretive for some reason about their, what they're working on. And they might be academic, they might be public sector. And there's not really any reason to be secretive. You know, there's not often not a commercial advantage from it. There's often no kind of um, privacy restrictions they have to stick to. So just kind of get your stuff out there. Amplifying what we do use and benefit from. So, I mean, in my case, it's things like split ticketing. But, you know, where, where you do use open innovations to an extent, you know, promote them, get other people to use them. Um, outputs from our work. So I'm a big fan of just, you know, meeting minutes. Just put them online. You know, the people who are interested in them will read them. Some people who might be interested in them might read them. And obviously, a lot of things that actually PTFS Europe probably do already. So you've all got communication channels. You know, Koha seems to have a great system for raising bugs, all that kind of stuff. But all those kind of aspects of open working are part of, you know, contributing to that that kind of communication commons of saying we're sharing what we're doing, we're talking about it, we're not being precious about our work, we're kind of making sure that other people benefit from what we do. So there's loads of different things people can do in terms of just open that aren't techie and data and, and you know, code. And I think that's about it. I don't know if that was five minutes or, or ten minutes or... Very interesting. Thank you very much. Very lots of questions. Very good questions. Hi, Dr. David. Uh, if I was going to start from scratch myself, the way open air came up, and then round and white ice cream round on a sunny beach. Yeah. How and where would you publish it? Website, yeah, well, there's everyone will probably know Wikipedia, um, but not many people know Wikidata, which is the kind of data equivalent. So, there's, there's already repositories out there that you can make use of. Um, so, let's say you do have a data set which is quite personal, you don't have an institutional repository, you don't have the kind of means of leveraging data.gov.uk or all those kind of things, you can just go to Wikidata and start publishing, you know, you know pretty much straight away. You can also, um, you know, have your own website. If you've got a spreadsheet, CSV file, whatever kind of data, data format you have, you can start to publish yourself. Um, the, the only really important thing is to be clear about people being able to access it and reuse. So it's nice to have an open license. So make sure that your data is not just, here's my data, and people a bit a bit of ambiguity as to whether people can actually use it or not. So publishing with an open license is, is important, but that's pretty much the you know all you need to do. Any questions? Uh, so so if you're talking organizational and you're public sector, you're recommended to use open government license. So it's now version three. And just a bit about licenses. So licensing is kind of both for you and for the user of your data or whatever you're publishing. Um, so it kind of protects them in terms of telling them that warning, warning that you know you they don't have support for it maybe, or kind of giving them kind of knowledge about the fact that they they're not going to get sued if they use it. It also protects you that it might kind of have disclaimers. You know, you, you don't have to worry about again then them suing you if your kind of data is wrong. You can kind of say look we've released it under this license, it's kind of your own your own risk. Um, similar to a kind of open source, you, I don't know, what, what does Koha publish under? Right. So like that, I mean, that's the public, so open government licenses, the public version, probably things like Creative Commons, um, if you were kind of doing a personal personal version. Not 
I think I've heard of Layers of London, but it wasn't very recently. Is that the one that has a kind of map and you can kind of add and remove things? I think it's got a library layer on it last yeah, time I looked. It's got basically what you're showing on the resume. It's a modern map of London, but everything on it is London. So there's a modern map of London, um, and then people can drop things like photographs or, you know, buildings. It used to look like church buildings or something there. And you can look at the layer old maps on top of it. So you've got the modern map of London and then you can layer like a bigger map on top of the stuff and you can make it like you know like a really sort of pretty picture of it. Um if you have like a certain amount of like a dodgy waiter, like say you've got a lot of photographs from your grandparents that you're great on that in a certain like location, you can add them to the system. That's another like really a really lovely feature of like kind of updating your data and yeah. storage of data. Yeah. And there's quite a few open map um, maps that have been released, so historical maps that are effectively they've taken the kind of paper map, um, often geo reference it. So geo referencing is just making sure that you kind of align various spots in the map with current day locations. Um, it's always a bit imperfect because the world moves and actually things shift and we don't like to think about that because the whole place is collapsing. But <laughs> in, in theory, you can kind of reference all the points on the map to kind of get them aligned with the real world and then you kind of got exactly what you say. You've got the kind of transparency layer where you can kind of, for example, see bomb sites in certain cities where you're then looking at the current layout of the city and you're kind of like moving the map to kind of see how it changes with the, the current day. So this isn't so personal really, but it's uh, we were discussing last night Facebook and kicking and splitting things. <laughs> and uh, which um, actually got Jacob here <laughs> um, and he had a lot of things to do with <laughs> um, but um, one if anyone feels like improving that one really good improvement to that would be sorting out the, the, uh, the sequence. So yes. um, it, it moves you from carriage to carriage to, uh, <laughs> uh, to the driver's seat and then back and then to the front. Uh, <laughs> so the data's in the deck and you can create a grid, you can go on and you can sort it out yourself manually yeah. to keep yourself in 34th if you want to. Um, I don't know what we uh, yeah, and I'm also I'm a bit of a stickler for making sure I get the, the very highest savings. So what I do is I use the split ticketing websites, discover what the journey is, and they always take a bit of a cut, which is quite reasonable for them to do. But I actually then go on the main website and tediously go through every journey <laughs> and work out when the return time is and when the outbound time is, and it takes it takes probably about an hour. But <laughs> but I, I like doing that, which is and then I get the kind of an extra ten pounds off. <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean it's a labour of love, isn't it? Spit tickety. Yeah. Okay, when you see this applying to sort of life and pension in the future, is gonna be a time when all the public libraries will be able to consider their data and use it in some sort of meaningful way? I think so, yeah. I mean the, the library sector obviously needs a hand doing it. Everyone's stretched, and I mean, certainly for public libraries, it's difficult to kind of say, "Oh, you should all publish data," because one problem also is that everyone would publish data in different different ways. So there's been various projects, and the DCMS uh, um, had a project to kind of do a data schema, so to kind of actually say, "Well, if you're going to publish data on the kind of ones I listed, like loans, catalogues, um, mobile library timetable is the most important one." Put them into, into this particular format, and then actually it's a, a standard set of data that everyone can everyone can use, and you can kind of merge together, aggregate, do all those kind of things. Libraries Connected now have taken up that work, and hopefully, are kind of they're looking at kind of creating a data repository and starting to actually look at collecting that data and kind of encouraging people to publish it. So it could be that we start having ha you know things like the membership mapping. I'd love it if we had a UK wide data set of library membership because you could start to actually analyze. Like I say, certain areas that have 50% membership, certain areas that have 10%, certain that have none. Mix that in with things like deprivation and other indicators, which will start to tell you why 
you don't have membership in certain areas. Um, and normally, I mean, unfortunately, in public libraries, that kind of stuff gets done occasionally, but it's normally during a consultation, and it's normally with the, the backdrop of which libraries don't don't we need anymore? Can we can we close? So, hopefully, that kind of stuff can get done day to day, and you can be looking at that data on a on a dashboard, seeing okay, we've we've done an outreach program here. We've increased membership from zero percent to to ten percent, and you know, see that almost in real time as it happens. Yeah, so, so thank you. That's a great plug for. <laughs> so the, the slight image I showed, the, the, the map which had the shading across, um, technically it was across census areas. So census areas are small areas that are standardized. They normally include, um, in that case, it was 1,500 people. Um, they're anonymized, so you can be safe publishing data against those census areas. And they do have things like, you know, who, how many people own a car or have more than one car. What is the deprivation of the area across all, all kinds of indicators, so like health, income, crime, and other things. So I created a tool where you can, as long as you can generate postcodes from your system, you can load in the postcodes. It's all held on your local computer, so you don't you reveal those postcodes to anyone. It converts it to the census-based areas, and then it maps it onto the map and tells you things like you've got 45% membership in this particular area. So. Um, It'd be great if people, you know, checked it out, and um, it's quite quite useful. I'd like to build up, build it up more. Kind of, I was getting a lot of feedback, but there's only so much time in a day. And as I say, I've got a two-year-old and split ticketing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he was clinging to my leg, saying, "Daddy, train." <laughs> Any more questions? No. So I think I see what you're doing about Jane Jason. Thank you very much, Steve. Oh, thank you. I love the idea of benches. So that's my point. Yeah. I think you have that interview available in Visual Well, <laughs> go, go on. So I, I haven't put links and all kinds of things, but open benches, you know, it'll be on, on the search engine. Um, it's got uh, it's only got a mobile app, but I think you can add the web app to your home screen, which is a kind of common thing you can do now. And yeah, every time you see a mem memorial bench, just take a photo of it. It automatically detects the in inscription, so it reads it, and so you don't have to do any of that. And then just upload it, and as I say, add to that 26,000 or so that they currently are. Any questions? Go ahead. Thank you, Camille.